special saints in Kirk that we celebrate. We celebrate in the time before uh, our nativity great, great martyrs and great saints. Um, I have a few feasts that I actually think we, uh, we, uh, we are aware that maybe Saint, um, Saint Gregory of, the, of Armenia is one of them today. We had Saint Nicholas last week and we had Saint Barbara and St. Juliana, we have a great saints today, I mean these days, and then <clears throat> the second day after, um, after the Holy Theophany, after baptism, we'll have St. Damiana, and um, we, we will celebrate that, uh, St. Barbara also in, in, this, in this month. Um, <clears throat> today we, we celebrate St. Gregory of Armenia. A very great saint, the church actually keeps him in high honor. St. Gregory of Armenia is the founder or the apostle uh, to the Armenians. He was the one, because of him, Armenia became the first Christian kingdom on earth. They are, they say that, if you go to Armenian church, they tell you we are the first Christian kingdom to be completely Christian. And today, if you go to Armenia, they're all Orthodox. Very few, very few Catholics. Um, and until now, today, we don't have any significant Protestant uh, denomination in Armenia. It's all, it's all Orthodox. Very pious people. If you go to them, they, you will think you've gone to Upper Egypt. Ustasaida. That's exactly it. So they see Abuna, they run to Abuna, they want to take a blessing, they want to be prayed for, they have a prayer request. Um, so um, very, very holy people. Don't, don't think of the Armenian that are here in the America, they're different. But the Armenian, Armenian in Armenia is very pious, talking about the regular people, very pious, and they, they are Christian. Um, there's something always I remember about St. Gregory of Armenia. They made him and St. Um, St. Arapsima, Arapsimi, they, like they, the Armenian would call her Arapsimi, St. Arapsima, and St. Gregory were, were a duet too. They worked together. And this is very interesting to see God working through different things. <clears throat> and how even the most painful things God used. So uh, St. Arab Sima, I don't know if you're aware of the story, she was not Armenian. She was from, I think, Greece. And she was a nun. In the time of Diocletian, the emperor. The time of Diocletian, this was the king or the emperor before Constantine. There was a time to persecute Christians. And they had a habit, the emperors, an evil habit. They go and send their soldiers, especially if they are young, they uh, send their soldiers to look for a wife. And, and the soldiers will, be, will do this job. So Diocletian apparently sent to... Um, to find a wife for himself. And they said, find me the most beautiful girl. That's how they think. Find me a, the most beautiful girl in the world. I want her to be the emperor, the empress, my wife. So they went through different places and eventually they found this convent in Greece and they looked and Alepsima was exceptionally, has some exceptional physical beauty, which she didn't care about much. She thought of it as a, as a, as a plague rather than a blessing to be beautiful. So they said, uh, the emperor Diocletian wants you. And uh, the nuns somehow managed to take some time, and they all ran. They all fled with Arab Sima. 
and they didn't know where to hide, so they, hide, they, they hid themselves in a, a very unknown place. Nobody would go there. Nobody think to go there in the mountains of Armenia. So uh, the, uh, the, king, the king soldiers couldn't find her. They were looking for her everywhere. And they uh, reported this to the emperor, and the emperor said, go find her anywhere. And he made a decree to the kings, said, I am looking for a girl. That's her name. That's how she looks. And if you have her anywhere, I need her. I need her to come to be brought to me. The king of Armenia at the time was a pagan king. His name was Tridata. Tridata was, or Tridat, was from a family, the royal family, who had uh, different members. One of the members was the, the father or the family of Gregory, the theologian. And they had a very heated dispute that actually the father of Gregory killed the father of Tridat. So there's a blood feud between them. There's a blood fight. So um, because Gregory was of a noble line, and Tridata didn't want to make a big deal out of the thing, so he said, OK, I'm not going to kill him. Let us put him in um, a, a dungeon, a deep place. So Grigory, by the time, was a Christian. His, his branch of the family were actually Christian. And Tridata was pagan. They were worshipping like pagan gods. They have different gods in the, over there, uh, like ancient Egyptians. So he put him in a dry well. I went and visited this place. Very, very tough, especially if you have uh, claustrophobia. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Very tough. So they, they go, you go down, deep, deep down, like maybe uh, 50 feet underground, a dark place. And he left him there. He, he was hoping that he would die without him killing him. So he doesn't, he doesn't want this to be counted against him. So Gregory actually survived, and I think it was years. I'm, I'm not sure, I forgot the numbers. It's eight or 10 or 15 even years, 15 years, 15 years. You read that in the story today. Fifteen years in this dungeon, and God sent him uh, a, a widow. It was a vision to a widow, go and feed Gregory. She would bring him food every day and throw it in this pet. And Gregory patiently endured it. That's why the, our church called him a martyr without shedding blood, because he endured fifteen years in this pet, living on very little food, and only thing that he can survive with is prayer. He grew prayer and his faith in Christ and his hope that he will be delivered. At the same time, Tridata heard of Arab Sima. He heard of her. Oh, this beautiful girl that uh, Diocletian and the whole world is looking for her is hiding in Armenia. They found her. And they brought her with, his, um, with her uh, mother superior and her sisters to Tridata. And um, the mother superior, I forgot the name, um, so they brought her to the, to the, to the palace, and Tridata says, um, you, you, I'm interested in you. I'm not going to give you to the equation. You'll be my wife. And she said, I'm not. I'm a nun. I dedicated my life to Christ, and I'm not going to be married. I'm not going to entertain that idea either. She said, okay, don't you know that I can actually kill you? He said, she said, go ahead. And he, he hesitated for a second and said, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to kill all those people that you like. And who is this, your mother? She called her mother. And uh, he took her, but the mother said to her, either he kills me or he doesn't kill me. Stay your ground. Don't yield to him. I don't care. We're all already given to Christ. So he killed the mother superior in front of her. And in Armenia, if you go today, the mother superior have a, have a church in her name where the place they killed her and she was buried there. You have her tomb. So the king was very angry, but when he started to insult the mother and, and um, uh, torture her, she went with all her force. She's a young teenager, and she went with all her, all her force to the king and pushed him. And when the king was pushed, he fell. got so angry that he forgot totally what he wants to do, and then he ordered the cutting of uh, Arab Sima, and they started cu cutting her in pieces in front of her sisters. 
By the end of this mad, bloody process, the king became uh, crazy. There are stories about him going like a wild beast, like unable to make any sense. His words were not making sense to that. So he went and became this way for many, many years. And, and the sister, his sister, um, took over the kingdom. This is real Armenian history. Took over the kingdom, and then she didn't know what to do with him. And then she said, uh, they told her, maybe if he can bring Grigory from this pet, he can heal him. So eventually, after 15 years, Grigory was brought out by the order of the, the queen, the, the sister queen, and they, they, they brought Grigory to Tridata, and Grigory um, and asked, asked the king, he said, if I heal you, if God heals you through my prayers, will you become Christians? And he made a sign like he understood. He, speak, he spoke to him like they, called, they said, he spoke to him like you have a wild boar or a donkey. So he, uh, he prayed for him, and his, he was definitely demon-possessed, most probably. And the king was healed. So immediately the king recognized uh, Grigory and recognized Christ, and he asked to be baptized. And they have a huge place where, and a feast where, where Tridata was baptized as the first Christian king with his sister and the family. And he ordered that uh, an, an, a big cathedral will be built in his capital, in, it, in, uh, in the capital at the time. And I don't know what the name was. So uh, uh, Gregory, uh, who was at the time was ordained a bishop actually by the by the bishops of of the area, and he uh, asked Christ to show him where should the cathedral be built, and the Lord showed him a piece of land, and he came in a vision. He said, "They say in a vision he came with a uh, a gold hammer in his hand, and he struck the earth in four corners." And wherever he struck the earth, there was a hole. So Gregory went in the morning and saw four holes to, de to depict or to, to tell him the piece of land that would be dedicated for the cathedral. So he, they call this, in their language, the place where the master descended. The place where the Lord descended. And, and in Armenia, it would be Ech Zin, which now is the capital of Armenia. So they built the cathedral, still, still there, and they renovated it hundreds of time, of course. Now they are going through our innovation. And the whole country was, became Christian. This was in the time of Diocletian. This is even before Constantine. That's why I'm saying they have the right to say we are the first kingdom to be Christian before Constantine, because Diocletian didn't care much for Armenia. He didn't touch the Armenians, so he let them do whatever they, they wanted. He was more interested in Egypt and Syria and Palestine and all these places. Uh, with uh, and Constantinople, which is Turkey, but Armenia is out of his. He didn't care much for it, so they became the first Christian country. And then after Constantine, they flourished and have tradition and monasteries and monks. But what I always look at is this duet to work, the work that God had done in Armenia through two humble souls, and two of them is helpless, by the way, very helpless. Think about this girl who has no power to defend herself. And this man who is thrown into a prison in a, in a hole has no power to defend himself. And through those two, what happened? This is the work of God. God does this always. Always God does this. Take a weak person, a, a person who doesn't mean anything to the world, and take circumstances that is very awkward and, and difficult and turn it around to become salvation. To become salvation. That's a mark of the work of God. God does not wait on us to be rich or powerful or healthy or seen or intelligent or smart or wise to do his work. Actually, in our humility, in our poverty, in our sickness, in our pain, that God works the best. He takes those circumstances and makes the best out of them. So whenever you feel like you're weak, then you say, I am strong. You feel you're poor and say, I am rich in God. You feel I am. You say I, you, you feel like you're sick. You're gonna say I am healthy and strong in God because God can take these things and He always does take things and turn it around. It only needs time, only needs time, because God's work happens slowly and patiently. And if we are not patient enough, we will not see things.
We will not see. We are in a hurry to do things. And this is one of the plagues of our time. I'm recognizing the plagues of our time. At least three plagues I recognized. One of them is democracy. <laughs> That's the first plague. Because we cannot recognize the rule of the king, even God, even Christ. How can I submit myself to Christ as a king when I want to fight very much for my independence from anything and anybody? The second one is the, uh, the um, what I'm thinking about is the communication, that very uh, strong communication that we have. Everybody has access to everything. So that we are very distracted all the time. There is no way to focus on anything. We're just going with the flow, like a, like a reed in the wind, like a, 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 a piece of wood in the ocean and the, and the waves of the ocean is tossing it back and forth. And the third thing that I think about is the hurry. We are plagued by being impatient. While everything worth doing has to take time. Everything worth doing. I remember that. Um, I read this book and it gives me those, those four categories of work. Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. He tells you that. He tells you the most insignificant, the most insignificant type of actions are done in hurry. And if they take most of your time, your, th your life is wasted. So the, he calls it insignificant and urgent. But also the urgent and not significant. Like, a, a, here we go, email, text message. Um, all these bothersome instigators that actually keeps demanding our attention. And he said that the, 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 the urgent and important things like, God forbid, Somebody gets a heart attack, a, an accident, something they have to pay attention about, it's extremely important, you cannot let it go, are rare. Our life should always be made of things that are important but not urgent. The most important and most significant things should make up, what, is, what are these? What are these? Our relationship with God, our prayer, should take the most of the attention. Our relationship with our family members, to build the relationship and to make us, to make us understand each other more, to develop more empathy, to develop more compassion, to develop more understanding. But we are, because of the Harry, we don't have time to that. So we pay attention to the insignificant things, but the significant things are psh, gone. We don't need it. We need. So that's why kids and adults the same. Don't pick on kids because sometimes you say kids play a lot of video games. They spend a lot of chatting time for things that doesn't matter really. No, adults do the same. We do, we do the same. We do the same. We spend a lot of time on insignificant things when it comes to building up a career, building up relationship with God, building up relationship with each other, building up skill and talent in what we do in our job. These are important things that has to kind of be built up, and it takes time. Time. Time is the essence. And now in the, in the Gospels of, uh, and I want to conclude with this, in the Gospels of Kiyak, there's this time, keeps repeating, it says, in the time of King Herod, in the time of his priestly service, after six months, and her time came to be delivered. What does that mean? That there is a time for everything, and everything happens in sequence. We don't Usually we, don't, we do depend on miracles and we expect miracles. That's nonsense. By definition, miracles are not supposed to be expected. They're not supposed to be expected. By definition. Miracles, they happen when God decides to. But we need to do our work. And our work has to be done in a patient, quiet, building up fashion. And we expect harvest in time. We ask God to help us and do our work patiently and quietly, and to know that when we are suffering, we are actually in the heart and the mind of God, that he's going to do something with us much more glorious than without that suffering. To him is the glory, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.